Paul. Cheers, David. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Paul Flintoft. I work at York Archaeology, formerly known as York Archaeological Trust. But a rebranding, changed the name. I still can't get used to it. So if I call it the Trust at any point, you'll point your finger and make me feel really guilty about it. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting Archaeological Paleo Environmental Archiving, Overcoming the Challenges for a Sustainable Future. Uh, the results I'm presenting today are the findings from my Historic England and University of Reading Collaborative Doctoral Partnership Project, Archaeological Paleo Environmental Archives, Challenges and Opportunities. Two of my supervisors are in the room, Duncan and Zoe, so no pressure. Um, what I'm going to set out to do today is uh, present some of the challenges that face the curation of archive paleo environmental remains, but also try and present some of solutions to the challenges that I sort of see as being sustainable rather than just short-term fixes, uh, but sustainable could be a, a short word for very expensive. Um, given I have a thesis worth of uh, information, I could focus on a few themes, but I thought given that today is uh, bringing together finds and archives, I decided to focus on the condition and treatment of paleo-environmental remains to highlight areas that perhaps require more improvement. And then secondly, uh, provide a very short examination of the challenges associated with accessing paleo-environmental remains and their associated data. So what are paleo-environmental remains for the uninitiated? Uh, I'm talking about um, charred waterlogged seeds, chaff, phytoliths, wood and charcoal, insects, pollen, diatoms, a whole host of different kinds of shell, preserved hair, fur, and again, a host of microfauna as well. Not to be absent from this list is animal bone. This wasn't included in my study. This is regarded as being a, a separate issue with its own challenges, which uh, Peter Guest highlighted earlier, trying to find um, cattle teeth. Um, these remains can be preserved through um, various processes, including being waterlogged, maybe in well or a shaft, or preserved in Fenland peat or a paleo channel, for example, or through the effects of charring or mineralization. So, due to the processes by which paleo environmental remains are preserved, we can divide these into two categories Got dry archives which include charred, mineral-replaced remains, maybe microscope slides. Um, an example here from the Market Lavington Charcoal at Wilshire in Wiltshire Museum. And wet archives, um, a nice example there provided by Gail at Bristol Museum. Hazel as well. Um, Wet archives are essentially um, waterlogged material which need to be uh, kept wet and are suspended in, or can be suspended in a variety of liquids, including ethanol, methanol, isopropanol, uh, glycerin, formaldehyde, or a weird and wacky combination of all of them, or some of them. Um, they should be kept in flame proof cabinets, such as the one that you can see in this image. Very well organized, it is too. Um, but kit like this obviously requires a lot of space to install it, to buy it. Um, the fluids need to be monitored and topped up. There's clearly more expense and effort involved in curating a, a wet archive than there is a dry archive. And we'll get to um, a bit more of that later on. So now I've highlighted what they are, uh, just gonna take a quick exploration of, of where they are. Um, and then examine some of my research. Uh, a lot of my research was informed by 14 museum partners that were absolutely vital to, um, uh, to gathering the data. Uh, the museum partners were identified by distributing 394 surveys. I'm imagining that a lot of people in the room filled them in, I'd like to think. Um, and the 300 and 94 museums were identified in the museums and collecting 
um, archaeology reports from 2016 to 2018, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, the questionnaire was kept deliberately short, just four questions to try and get as many people to engage with it as possible. Um, I know how busy everybody is. I don't know how many questionnaires people get. So I did my best to try and keep it um, short and sweet. And of the uh, 394, got uh, 60, uh, 76 respondents, which given the amount of surveys that people are sent, I was actually quite happy with 76. I thought that was, um, that was, that was a good respondent rate. And of the 76 respondents, 33 agreed to participate in the project and critically had archaeological paleo-environmental materials in their possession. But to filter that down into um, areas that had more material for my analysis, I uh, conducted a keyword search using uh, OASIS using terms such as paleo-environmental, insects, waterlogged, cereal, pollen, and chard to try and identify counties and unitary authorities that at least according to OASIS um, uh, are more likely to have higher quantities of paleo-environmental materials in their museum stores. Um, I generated a heat map that uh, shows 20 of the highest respondents. You can see London, for example, um, it's like a big red blob there because that's where uh, we've got the highest number of respondents from. Um, and then I cross-referenced the uh, 33 respondents with the um, heat map and identified the 14 uh, museum partners that you can see in the table. Uh, each of the museums was uh, visited and the curators were kind enough to give me uh, some of their time, answer in-depth interviews regarding their um, paleo-environmental archives and provided me with quantitative and qualitative data. So I'll start off with some more cigarette boxes. Um, apparently specialists back in the day used to go through quite a lot of tobacco, it seems. Um, the dry materials overall are in what I would regard as being quite good condition, but there are certainly uh, examples where repackaging does need to occur. We can see the uh, in the bottom left, this is uh, Mere Lake Village. Um, I mean, they've been in there for nearly 100 years, probably. Um, they really could do to be repackaged into rigid plastic or, or glass, preferably glass uh, vials. And then you can also see some charcoal from the uh, Blake Street excavations in York, and they're just in uh, brown paper. And you can see from uh, in that photograph there that it's quite recently become broken and abraded. Uh, so um, I, I would recommend that charcoal kept in, in bags needs to be transferred into something um, rigid to stop it from getting broken further. Shell um, is also damaged. And in uh, the case on the left, you can see it's actually started to go moldy. Um, and also kept in, in brown paper and has been recently broken as well. Uh, shell, if exposed to plastic, um, can develop Bynes disease, which causes the outer shell to start to deteriorate. So in a way, the fact it's in paper isn't a bad thing from that point of view, but the fact that it's getting crushed is um, terrible. So ideally, it needs to be transferred into... Um, uh, metal boxes, uh, according to uh, natural history practice, at least. Uh, wet materials are unfortunately in what we can consider to be largely poor condition. Insects in particular are in poor condition. Um, with the drying out of a lot of waterlogged sites, uh, these archives are likely to become more valuable in time because we're not going to be able to go back to a lot of these sites to excavate them. I mean, Star Car is a classic example. Um, so it, it really is uh, an area that requires a lot of attention. And I think if people are aware that they have got wet archives, I would strongly recommend, whoa, um, uh, 
uh, having a, a condition assessment of their archives and, uh, and seeking advice on how to um, monitor and repair them. And uh, just very quickly, I think this summarises the condition of uh, Pillar Environmental Archives in England quite well. This is the Willsford shaft, which is uh, half wet, half dry. And as you can see, the, the dry labels are in you know, fine form. The wet material is um, in uh, far less um, decent condition. And I think that's probably quite representative of uh, Pillar Environmental material in England. Um, so I think child material needs to be transferred into a rigid container. I think shell maybe needs to be repackaged um, where possible, maybe have condition assessments of wet archives. And maybe we should consider a national store for wet archives. Um, that might be one for discussion later. Uh, I'm just going to very quickly go through this. Um, it's following on from what Peter said earlier, actually. It was really interesting presentation that... Um, when trying to find pillar environmental material, uh, I struggled a lot of the time. Um, I did an entire assessment of Southwest Heritage Trust archives and found that 12% of them didn't have the environmental component it was missing, presumably still with the um, specialist. And of the uh, museum partners, been able to find the, um, the, the material was less than straightforward. And it seems to be putting off uh, researchers from wanting to commit to archival research because materials are either difficult to find or, um, or, or just absent. Uh, museum catalogues as well um, aren't really up to snuff for what um, environmental archaeology researchers require. They rarely contain spatial or taxonomic data um, or quantities, conditions. Um, so I think we need to uh, update how we um, database and communicate pillar environmental data. <clears throat> um, so in terms of solutions for access, um, I think it would be worthwhile conducting archive audits and trying to identify what pillar, pillar environmental materials are actually present, um, identify what is missing and perhaps have an, an amnesty or try and track down the specialists. They did smoke quite a lot, it turns out, so maybe sooner rather than later. Um, consider maybe having a national archive, which I know is um, a hot topic anyway, um, and um, have an online catalogue of what's stored and includes taxa, condition, uh, the period that it's from as well. Um, so in conclusion, we just need to move it all into its own store, <laughs> basically, nice and easy, and have um, uh, maybe an, an Oasis Plus model or something that can um, uh, help researchers um, find the material and, and um, conduct synthetic research with it. Um, sorry about, I was a bit rushed at the end there. I, uh, sorry, David, but yes, thank you. <clears throat>